If you own a business, Elite Benefits of America wants to remind you that health insurance open enrollments are either happening now or coming very quickly. And this is the time to review and implement a health care plan to make or keep you as the employer of choice. Deadlines for open enrollment range between November 1st and January 1st. Get ahead of the curve. The Small Business Special Enrollment Period, part of the Affordable Care Act, now allows employers with 49 employees and under to offer health benefits without contributing a dime to the employee plan. Help your employees save money on taxes with health insurance they're already paying for with their hard-earned dollars. Butch Zemar from Elite Benefits of America wants you to reach out to him today. Visit EliteBenefits.net or call 708-535-3006. This is the ZMAR Podcast. Elite Benefits of America helps small and mid-sized companies with their health insurance programs. And now, your host, Butch ZMAR. We're at the beginning of the renewal season for most small and mid-sized companies, especially in the uh, Midwest uh, region, but most across the country, most of the plans renew January 1st. Large companies are already pretty much, they should be done with January 1st renewals, and they're getting gear things up with uh, open enrollments even this month of October. Uh, a lot of bigger companies do their open enrollments early so they can get everything processed in time. It's a very efficient process, but uh, right now they're already working on 2024 stuff, even though the open enrollment is just beginning now. So, uh, but small, mid-sized companies don't think that far in advance, so um, they wait until the last second. Even brokers wait to the last second, uh, and it's just the way their business model was. And I would say, yeah, maybe early on, uh, we all did the same thing with hiring of the urgent um, or whatever that phrase is. It just kind of wait until the urgency is there to do anything. And so when there's a deadline, all of a sudden we react to it. But the reality is, is just because you have a January 1st re, uh, renewal doesn't mean you should wait until December 15th to handle any of it. In some cases, it might be too late. But but during the open enrollment, um, we have this huge focus to talk about uh, or and review um, the numbers, right? So everything's about cost going in or cost going out, right? And so that's a huge focus. And then how we're going to roll it out to the employees. One of uh, the areas that gets overlooked because of being overwhelmed and and so much focus on financial dollars is compliance. And uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about compliance and I got a Department of Labor uh, story to tell here in a bit because there's a current event that occurred that uh, I end up having the the privilege of talking to the Department of Labor on one of uh, our clients, Um, but all good news. So I'll share that here momentarily. So I'm going to tie things back to military compliance for what I did. I was in the aviation world. We worked on fighter jets, but I worked on the boxes inside the jets. And so anybody that watches Top Gun or the Top Gun Maverick, um, when they're videotaping it inside the cockpit, um, a lot of the stuff inside the cockpit we worked on, and then there was a lot of modules or boxes throughout the wings and uh, the fuselage that we worked on too. But... um, when we work on these things, there's a quality control situation that really needs to take into place or quality assurance, I guess is what they call it. I don't know if it's changed at all as far as the name and terminology, but you had to go through a class and there's a review board and you get you get signed off that you're able to inspect the quality of work that's going on in these boxes. And so we make sure it's right. We make sure Everything is put together without any extra parts inside of it, any tools left inside, and to make sure that it even passes the results. So today we work on these boxes and we hook them up to a big computer to help troubleshoot these boxes. Um, If we rewind 50 years, we had some of that where we put things together uh, onto a uh, testing portal, so to speak, or what we would call today, or back then they called it benches. So you hook up O scopes and and meters and we had these benches that help troubleshoot but a lot of it was manual today it's not it's a lot of it's digital and electronic and so you just hook it up and we still have to do some intuition and troubleshooting skills but computers actually help with the process so we have to go through and in some cases these um, quality control people would ask for a printout of the past results before signing off on it 
eventually if they build enough trust with you that you're working on quality stuff you don't have to worry about that so much but they inspect every single box before it leaves uh, make sure there's no loose parts make sure that everything is buttoned up sometimes you have to reseal it with like a caulking or a glue um, and they're specified by the government uh, for those specific boxes so a lot of things they have to be going through like a checklist we talk about checklists all the time but and then there's a stamp of approval for compliance reasons um, and we have to make sure that uh, um, everything's done correctly you know in order to get to that point there's a process right so uh, i'm going to talk specifically by the uh, about the naval air station oceana virginia beach uh, because there was a maintenance officer that went above and beyond he was an overachiever uh, in some ways he could have been a real jerk uh, but um, he did it for the better outcome of results of maintenance on on uh, aircraft in the fleet on the east coast and so he had a bigger perspective than some of us having to go through the process, but it, it actually helped along the way. So usually uh, they get, uh, go through compliance and become a quality control specialist or inspector, whatever you want to call it. You had to go through and study and then take a written exam that's closed book. And then if you passed, and I don't know what the score was, then you were given the privilege of, of getting the special stamp to stamp off on paperwork and making sure everything is good. But what this maintenance officer did was he wanted to put you on a special review panel. And so basically, in a nutshell, you sat in a room and you were just scrutinized for 90 minutes. And like uh, this guy knew the maintenance manual inside and out, and he wanted to make sure that you were second best at it. And so he threw out questions and concerns and even what page numbers there certain things were on. It was insane. Um in fact, it was so exhausting after 90 minutes, it was like playing a sporting event and then having the inability to walk uh, off the field. And so some other departments, maintenance departments may or may not do this. Maybe one day there's a, a guy I worked with when I was in, uh, Robert, he may be listening to this podcast, but uh, maybe we'll get him as a guest. Maybe he can get us up to speed on some of the changes. Yeah, he did 22 years and, uh, and they definitely changed the avionics world during that time. So and part of it was a lot of the work that he did. Tying it back to open enrollments, we're, we're, we're so busy looking at these numbers. We're always save, 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 try to get these numbers rolled back. But a lot of things on that list, and, and they're important. You, know, you have to uh, let employees review their plan and the cost. They, we have to get insurance cards out to the employees, uh, especially for the ones that cha made cha plan changes. Uh, we have to look at potential savings along the way to see if there's opportunity to help employees in certain ways as well as the company. We have to update payroll and make sure that's all updated. Otherwise, there's conflict with people's pay, which is another compliance issue. So items in the compliance world definitely get overlooked because there's higher priorities because of um, more urgency to because the, the almighty dollar, right? And so back to this Department of Labor story. I did receive a personal phone call from uh, a representative on a client of ours, had no idea even to this day how he even got my number or even knew that we were involved. And I guess there was confusion from a new hire about eligibility for benefits. And I'm not going to get into too much detail, but so this employee felt the need to bring it to the Department of Labor's attention. And... Uh, Actually, the Department of Labor guy has been great. So uh, any negative um, or cringing that you were doing right before or as we were leading into this, um, just ease up a little bit because the guy was super nice. He wasn't trying to get anybody in trouble. He's just trying to respond to an inquiry. There were specific items he was looking for. We had to update some of it, but um, and he told me multiple times uh, that at, at the end of the day, if uh, all he did was bring the company a little bit more compliant than it was, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, then he did his job. So uh, I, I'm under the impression that they're not there to hurt these businesses necessarily. They're there to just make sure that um, we're, we're living a better life a after the conversation. So there was two key components, and I'm just bringing those up, and we're going to get into other things. Is One is the updated employee handbook. Um, so a lot of small, mid-sized companies don't have a handbook where they have a quasi handbook uh, on a memo sheet that was published, you know, 20 years ago or something related to that. And so there's tools out there. You could do it. You could download templates, but, um, and in fact, call our office. We'll give you access to a tool for free. We'll get you in there and you could, it's a wizard that asks you a hundred thousand questions. It probably will take you 40 minutes or so to go through 
some a lot of it for small businesses won't even pertain to you, such as cell phone policies, right? Maybe you, your company's at a point where you need it, and a lot of small businesses are not. And then there's other things that are in there that are required or not required. It'll tell you. You could delete. You can make changes to it. Uh, you could add your own personal verbiage to it. You could add your own stories to whatever you want. It's your handbook. And so um, the next thing was called the RISA wrap document. And this is highly, highly overlooked. Um, most, I would say, majority of the small businesses definitely don't have it. There's an additional cost every year. And the, from the world of Butch Zimar, I do believe it's a government overreach for uh, to make something more formal um, about the benefit packages that are available. So uh, in a nutshell, it's almost like a boilerplate document that in between gets smashed, uh, smashed is the benefits that are even available, which is in the enrollment guide that's provided to the employees during open enrollment. So they just take this boilerplate, smash that in the middle of it, and there you go. You got a wrap document. And I'm over uh, simplifying the whole process. There's a little bit more involved, but that it was an over o- oversight. And give you an idea, I don't I don't know what the HR handbook uh, penalty would have been. He he didn't tell me about any penalties. He wasn't concerned about penalties. But I did look up a couple things before the podcast. But that RISA wrap document would be $110 a day back to the start of the health policy. And so if you don't have an ERISA wrap document, and let's just say uh, even if you didn't, you started the policy a year ago, it's $110 times 365 days, right? And so there is a cap, right? So so um, it's much smaller than 365 days, but, but there is a cap, but it's still a penalty. But I always say that some of these things, especially related to the benefits world, is the busted taillight when you get pulled over and you had a, a few, maybe one or two drinks more than you probably should have. And that's the real, real offense, right? But um, the busted taillight is not. So I always call these the busted taillight. You're just giving them a reason to keep going, right? Um, every business is out of compliance in some degree. No business is perfect because they're focused on serving clients and generating revenue and employing uh, people, good people uh, for the company. So I just want to go over a few other ones. So in, in compliance during the open enrollment, these are a couple things that are a few things that you, you, need, you should look at and at least have on your checklist that you need to accomplish. And it may not be in the next three months, but I tell you, you need to bring it to the forefront and get this thing taken care of um, because more and more people uh, are going to get audited, especially with recent hirings of the IRS side, which is a piece of this. And then uh, who knows what's going to happen with the Department of Labor. But so one is disclosure requirements. So the carriers do provide some of the disclosures. Um, actually, a lot of them. It's just some are missing. There's also new hire disclosures. And um, these are required, um, open enrollment and the new hires. And sometimes you need to do a fresh deck and, and get it out to your employees because, uh, for example, the new hire disclosures are a little bit different than the open enrollment uh, disclosures. Like, for example, for the new hire disclosure, there's a COBRA disclosure in there. It's not a part, normally part of the open enrollment disclosures. And so, therefore, if you had a disgruntled employee, if you're an employer listening, and they work for you for 10 years and they leave and for some reason something comes up and the Department of Labor gets involved and they ask if you ever had a COBRA notice disclosure, how are they in the world are they going to remember, right? So it has to be documented. You have to prove that you actually did it. That specific disclosure is $110 a day um, and so as well. So um, it could financially be devastating times that by the number of employees over a period of time. There's a number of things, right? So you just have to be careful uh, there. And some of those other uh, disclosures are $100 a day. So it could just keep adding up. Because, like I said, it's a busted taillight for them to keep looking, right? Another one is called the 125 document. This is the IRS document that allows for a pre-tax document. This is usually done by a payroll company. It may not, though. Um, and they may be charging a fortune. Some of them out there are charging... 1500 to $2,000 a year for a document that um, most companies will do on an annual basis for uh, about three to $500. And so you have to be careful on these fees. It's easy money for the payroll companies, and it is required to authorize pre-tax documents. It actually never leaves your office. It is a boilerplate document that does get updated by the IRS every day with standard verbiage. And then you add in um, what's being authorized for pre-tax, FSA, HSA, medical plan, dental plan, vision plan, whatever it might be. It's listed there. And then you execute it by signing it and putting it in a folder in case you ever get audited. And so that's it. 
It's a simple document. It is required. There is an IRS penalty for it, not only from not having it, but also the missed payroll taxes that you're avoiding by doing pre-tax without the document. Uh, again, I, th- I do think it's an overreach, um, but that's from the world of Butch Zimar, but it is what it is. It's a document. Call our office. We'll be able to take care of that, plus the ERISA wrap document, too. Um, we can handle that as well. And obviously, the one of the talking points we already had was the employee handbook allows for more clarity on how things are handled uh, when it comes to an employee situation. So definitely should consider updating or getting one, even though maybe you don't feel like it's required. Uh, for 40 minutes of time, it could save you some penalties or issues later. A couple other ones that we have to worry about, and um, I'm just bringing up because there's a list of penalties. I can email you the list of penalties. Just contact our office. I'm happy to email you a list, uh, no obligation. Um, I didn't create the list. I, we got it from somewhere else. The 5,500 reporting, if you have over 100 employees enrolled in a health plan, and I'm just talking about health specifically, 401ks and other products could be a little bit different and require you a 5,500 reporting prior to that, um, and it's done annually. And this one's a hefty one of $2,400 a day um, if you don't do that. And so we have um, a tool that we could search 5,500 reporting filings. It's public record. And... uh, There's a lot of companies that pull up in this list that are not compliant. Um, They may think they are, or they thought their broker was doing it, or they thought HR manager was doing it, or CFO, or there was a change in those positions, and that was one of the items missed. And so you have to go back and look at that. Obviously, there's FMLA requirements. Um, There is a new thing with the Affordable Care App called the PCORI fee. Um, It's it's an acronym for something I can't really cite out right now, but it's uh, on a lot of level funded or self-funded plans. You have to file a tax per employee enrolled in the plan. And uh, again, it's just a revenue generated thing from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, But that is a compliance issue and it's a tax fine on the Affordable Care Act reporting requirements. So if you're 50 and above, uh, there's an IRS regulation where you have to file annual reports, kind of like a 1099 and a W-2, but it's related to who's taking benefits, who's not. So the IRS knows who's, who's had, has it. But again, I, 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 I have some differences why, why that's even there. But anyhow, so they're taxing you on uh, some of the uh, level funded and self um, self-funded products there. There's HIPAA guidelines that you have to meet. Otherwise, um, if you don't, there's um, definitely compliance there. And then there's so many other industries that should be able to come in your door and audit or at least do a review that you should bring in for compliance reasons uh, that you should definitely do and like bring in your IT consultant and make sure that there's compliance and security checks in place. Like um, you cannot just email applications to your broker via email it's a violation whether you know it or not uh, if you don't send it securely because there's hipaa uh, and personal health information phi information in that email and if somebody's email gets hacked someone's stuff is going to get stolen and the fines can be really hefty depending on uh, what they determine and how how many people are breached and so it, it's happening every day uh, bring in your property and casualty agency uh, um, to talk about um, other compliance issues. Uh, that's important, too. There's an employee benefits liability insurance policy um, that employers should have in place. A lot of them are packaged in, but make sure you have that because if you misinform an employee about a benefit package and they you get sued for it or there's a claim. So, like, for example, uh, if there was an uh, assumption of an auto enrollment and medical and it wasn't communicated well and they thought they had benefits and they end up in the hospital, there could be some issues. And of course, I'm not the PNC agent. You're going to have to see technicalities in the certificate of the policy. But those are just some things if there was an oversight on your part from a from an HR or a uh, employee benefit standpoint, then obviously EPLI, which is Employer Practices Liability Insurance, which is important. That's in case somebody gets offended in the workplace um, and they file a lawsuit. And there's many, many cases on those, as well as just a whole bunch of other programs that should be in place um, that that help protect your employees, as well as the clients that you serve. And so with your open enrollments coming up and your renewal process, uh, I would definitely take some just a little bit of time to figure out what compliance issues that you're overlooking or been putting off and start making it a priority because they're going to be coming for you. And if you need 
a little bit more information on any of these areas or if you need to solve um, for some of these compliance issues, whether we do it in-house or we outsource or point you in the right direction, we'd be happy to do so. Just contact our office and um, stay compliant.